Good afternoon. I'm Cindy Pfeiffer. Uh, welcome to the Women in Leadership of the Washington Times Foundation webinar titled Influence and Leadership of the United States First Ladies, Perspectives of the Chief of Staff and Key Personnel. When looking at nation building, both at home and abroad, there are those working behind the scenes affecting changes of a nation in what is referred to as soft diplomacy. This fulfills the task of building bridges and brings about reconciliation. Our program would like to honor the presidential first ladies and their chief of staff and key personnel. These fine groups of women truly make an impact in our nation, as you will come to understand when hearing their stories. Um, I would like to introduce our moderator, Mrs. Vicki Teahart. She was a former president of the Congressional Club from 2005 to 2006. The Congressional Club is a service organization for spouses of members of Congress, of the Supreme Court, and of the administration. So Vicki's husband was former Congressman Todd Teahart of Kansas. She served also on the First Lady's Luncheon Committee during the Clinton, Bush, Obama, and Trump administrations and chaired the Congressional Club for Mrs. Laura Bush in 2001. Vicki holds a degree in psychology and speech pathology and serves on several nonprofit boards, including Best Friends Foundation that promotes core values with high school students. Other nonprofits she works with includes the Congressional Wife Speakers, Sarah's Hope, the Global Vitaligo uh, Foundation and the American Prayer Initiative. And her most important role, she says, that she likes is being that of a Christian wife, mom, and grandmother. So we are welcoming Vicki Teahart. Thank you, Cindy, so much. Thank you. What a fascinating program. I want to give a very warm welcome to each of you attending today and especially to our presenters. These women worked behind the scenes, but their role is not diminished at all as they observed and sometimes actually formed history. Our first presenter is Cherie Harder, then we will have Jean Becker, and then Alexa Fish Ward. A little more about the Women in Leadership um, program of the Washington Times Foundation. This program is committed to honoring the legacy of women leaders by engaging them in its mission, devoted to America's founding ideals and to public service. As a project of the Washington Times Foundation, Women in Leadership encourages the highest ideals in cultural values and public mindedness in an effort to build bridges of understanding. Women in Leadership aims to bring women leaders together beyond any specific political leaning or religious traditions, and through reaching out to the community, building co-prosperity, affirming religious and racial harmony, and promoting stable families. This mission could not be more timely and needed today. Our first presenter is Cherie Harder. Cherie served as Director of Policy and Projects for First Lady Laura Bush from 2007 to 2008. She also served the president, George Walker Bush, as a special assistant to his administration. Mrs. Harder is president of the Trinity Forum, a nonprofit organization which cultivates and promotes the best of Christian thought to equip leaders to lead wisely. I give you Cherie Harder. You can add first. I want to just thank Cindy, Tom McDevitt, Dr. Michael Jenkins for the invitation to join you all today. It's a real pleasure. And I'm particularly disappointed I'm not able to join you live. I would have loved to have heard the comments uh, from Alexa Ward and Jean Becker. We'll look forward to watching those later. But it's a real pleasure just to be able to join you to talk a little bit uh, about the influence, the power, the scope of First Ladies. 
And it's one of those positions, I think, where uh, it's often underestimated or even overlooked, but of course the, the scope of the influence is extraordinary. And uh, the, the amount of effort that so many First Ladies put into the work is really astounding. That was certainly true of the First Lady that I had the honor and privilege of getting to work for, uh, Laura Bush. I worked for Mrs. Bush in 2007 and 2008 as her director of policy and projects. Uh, what that means basically, which might be a little bit confusing and that one might think, well, the first lady, of course, does not set policy. And that's true, she's not an elected official. Uh, but as the first lady, she has extraordinary scope uh, to influence, to raise awareness, to convene, to offer hospitality, uh, and even in the whole realm of global diplomacy. And I'll try to talk about a few of those points uh, just briefly. Uh, and in many ways, I think there's there's kind of an underestimation of just uh, the influence that happens with that. You know, in terms of public awareness, one of the projects that I uh, had, the, had the privilege of working with Mrs. Bush on was uh, in 2007, it was at the time that the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief in Africa, or PEPFAR, as well, well as the Presidential Malaria Initiative, PMI, both were coming up for reauthorization uh, in Congress. I think um, history has already shown and will show even more what an extraordinary achievement both of these initiatives were. Uh, just in terms of the lives saved, the family saved, uh, just the human, um, uh, just the, the influence in terms of human well-being across an entire continent in the world. Um, it really is extraordinary. Uh, but as they were coming up for reauthorization, there's always, of course, um, people who may not disagree, who may not agree, who may not be aware of just how important it is. It's not the same priority for them. And so one of the things a first lady can do is uh, through her own initiatives and, um, and activities, increase public awareness of a wonderful program that was saving uh, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of lives. So one of the things Mrs. Bush did was actually take a trip to Africa, uh, just to give you a sense of how much work and activity is packed into such a short time. Uh, in five days, uh, Mrs. Bush, her staff, uh, security, and uh, she brought along some members of the press as well, went to Africa and back, went to four different countries, uh, engaged in at least 30 different activities uh, and visits and sites, met with a couple of world leaders uh, before arriving back home all within five days. So in five days, we left DC, we went to um, Mali, Senegal, Mozambique, and Zambia, returned home, uh, having met with, I think it was two world leaders um, and engaged in 30 different site visits or activities later. Uh, that's the kind of schedule that a First Lady often keeps up. Uh, it's really pretty extraordinary as a staff member. It's both exhilarating and can be utterly exhausting, uh, but of course is, um, it is an amazing opportunity. During her, her trip, uh, she would visit different uh, PEPFAR sites, sites where the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief was actually being implemented, saving lives. She would meet with many of the people who had received uh, whether it was bed nets to prevent malaria as part of the president's uh, malaria initiative, uh, or had been uh, receiving you know health care through um, through PEPFAR uh, or education or training, uh, and efforts to train the trainers as well. And by doing so, uh, she she also brought along a bunch of of media too. The the um, the first lady's plane was sort of divided into three sections with Mrs. Bush and her staff closest to the front, the second section being uh, Secret Service and protection, and the media were usually kept uh, in the, the, the seats towards the back with Secret Service sort of in between the media uh, and uh, the First Lady and her staff. But she would go back and talk with them as well as bring them along to a lot of the sites so that they too could see what was happening um, in, in different places yeah, across Africa. That came right at a time that uh, I mentioned PEPFAR was up for reauthorization. Uh, as we all know, it was indeed reauthorized. 
and is, I think, a vital part and um, a really noble part of President Bush's legacy, you know, from, from here on out. And, um, and the result of that initiative is that literally millions of lives probably have been, have been saved. Um, hundreds of thousands of children are no longer orphans. Uh, malaria in particular uh, would affect kids between uh, essentially babies and six-year-olds were uh, the age group most affected. So there are many people alive today because of that presidential initiative and because it was reauthorized. Re A second way that I think First Ladies can, uh, can exert a large influence just in terms of, um, of their completely non-political or non-partisan activities is through their use of the convening power that uh, attends a First Lady and the extension of hospitality. Uh, there are many times in which invitation to the White House, non-political invitations, uh, can actually help forge really important relationships and understandings that pave the way for important progress to be made, uh, as well as the sort of soft, um, soft power, one could call it, of including other people, um, including other groups, uh, making them feel heard and welcome, uh, as well as elevating some of the key issues that the First Lady personally cares about. One example of this was Mrs. Bush's sponsorship and leadership and involvement in the National Book Festival every year. Uh, many of you will know that Mrs. Bush's background is as a librarian. Um, reading, books, literacy have always been terribly important to her. And one of the ways one can uh, increase interest in support for that is by uh, extending hospitality and convening people to talk about it. And of course, uh, the National Book Festival was an extraordinary example of that. You know, Mrs. Bush certainly wasn't alone in, in working on that, but her leadership, her name, her involvement brought a lot of attention, certainly elevated its, um, its reach, its visibility, its impact. Uh, the fair that was the National Book Festival brought many of our greatest authors to one place, and of course, people then thronged to see them, to hear from them, to you know, hear readings and the like. And it was a way, um, you know, a wonderfully inspiring, a hospitable way of drawing awareness, um, attention, and support uh, for an issue that's very dear to her heart, uh, which is in increasing uh, reading you know, in America. Uh, so that's a, a second way I think that um, that first ladies can can influence real leadership um, and real influence uh, through through hospitality and through their own convening power. Uh, a third way, which may be a little bit less uh, intuitive than some of the others, is I think in, Mrs. Bush played an extraordinary role in some forms of global diplomacy. And what do I mean by that? Um, one of the things that Mrs. Bush did that um, you know, had very little attention at the time is as a librarian, there were librarians in, uh, in nations that were, um, had restricted freedoms that really looked to her. Uh, and there were times that she would, would speak, uh, would be broadcast to librarians in places like uh, Cuba or, or other places. Uh, in addition, one of the big projects that she worked on while I uh, was working for her was a luncheon for other First Ladies at the UN General Assembly. It's hard to kind of overstate just what a big project uh, that was. And as an aside, just as a sense of the workload that a First Lady deals with, you know, during um, 2007, the year that I was there at the White House, uh, Mrs. Bush had over 176 different appearances or projects. Now, some of those could be as, you know, relatively um, small as, say, a, a photo, uh, photos and a meeting with the 4-H winners, but it could range from that to planning and hosting a, a luncheon for um, 
over 100 first ladies at the UN General Assembly and did all that within a year. Uh, and of course, even a small event with a first lady is, is quite a production. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. There's briefing papers to be written. There's lots of details to be nailed down. There's lots of people uh, who need to be invited, vetted uh, before they're admitted to the White House. But an assembly, a luncheon for a bunch of first ladies of the UN General Assembly is a, is a huge undertaking. And there's a lot of considerations that go into it. There's a lot of uh, uh, both uh, coordination with the State Department, with the National Security Council, and the like. But it was a way of convening um, all of the First Ladies, well, not all, but so many of them across uh, the country, uh, across the world. Uh, first Ladies from rogue nations were, were not invited, but First Ladies from uh, nations that were not uh, rogue or hostile regimes were, and getting to meet them. Uh, helping to forge relationships across countries. Uh, many of those relationships, of course, lasted long beyond uh, that, that luncheon. Uh, and it was a way of you know, extending hospitality to build positive relationships, which, um, you know, which help set the, a foundation of uh, communication and trust in, in terms of global diplomacy. And the First Lady has uh, the scope to do that uh, in a way that, um, that really no other position does. I think it's fair to say that Mrs. Bush performed all of those functions with extraordinary grace, finesse, humility, um, as well as just complete classiness. She was someone who took the role quite seriously. Um, had a lot of ideas and initiatives, uh, always seemed unruffled, and yet as a staff person working for her, was constantly impressed just by the extraordinary stamina, uh, as well as grace uh, under pressure, under deadline, and often in cases when anyone would have been exhausted. It was something I think she modeled well, and the influence that she had and that she exercised, I think, left the world a better place. So thank you again for the invitation to talk with you just a little bit about some of the observations I had uh, during the time that I had the privilege of serving Laura Bush as her po director of policy and projects in the White House. And I am sorry to miss what I'm sure is a fascinating gathering, but look forward to watching it later. Thanks again. Thank you, Cherie Harder. That, that is just so interesting. Uh, Todd and I were in Washington, D.C. during the Bush administration, and I had many opportunities to work with Mrs. Bush and to observe her. I agree that she was a delightful first lady and a very serious first lady. Do you remember the red dress she wore for the inaugural ball, his first inauguration? It was just absolutely spectacular. What a dress. Um, also, her work for our national parks. She had a group of friends from her um, high school days and they would go to different national parks every summer. So that model of close friendships, enjoying our great outdoors, and then their marriage was so strong and, and President Bush delighted in her. Um, just a wonderful example of a first couple. So thank you, Cherie, for sharing your experiences. Our next presenter worked for Laura Bush's mother-in-law, Jean Becker served as Deputy Press Secretary to First Lady Barbara Bush, and she also worked for President George Herbert Walker Bush. She oversaw the opening of his library, um, which is a tremendous undertaking in 1997. Jean Becker was the longest standing Chief of Staff to President George Herbert Walker Bush, serving from 1994 to 2018. First Lady Barbara Bush considered Jean her friend, confidant, and speechwriter. I give you Jean Becker. Privilege to join all of you today, to join this great group of women leaders. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for asking me to talk about Barbara Bush. I worked for her for nearly 30 years, which was one of the great privileges of my life. She was smart, she was focused, she was honest, some people might say sometimes she was a little too honest. She was very outspoken, and yes, she could be tough. One of the things I loved about working for her is you never, ever had to wonder what she was thinking because she always told you. 
always. I like to tell my friends and family that I have a spine that looks like this. In fact, it's really hard to hurt my feelings. And I owe that to Barbara Bush. She, she made me, uh, she made me tougher than I think I was before I went to work for her. I'll just tell you one quick story about how, how blunt she was. I was her speechwriter in the post White House days. And for some reason, I included in one of her speeches, this funny little story I had read about Jerry and Betty Ford's sex life. She called me at six o'clock in the morning, the night after she had read the speech, or she probably had read it that morning. She called me at 6 a.m., woke me up and said, Jean Becker, what the hell were you thinking? And you know, here's the thing about Barbara Bush. She was always, almost always right. What the hell was I thinking talking about Jerry and Betty Ford's sex life? Anyway, I met her in 1988, really late 87. I was a reporter for USA Today, and I covered the 1988 election for USA Today. I was the feature writer for the political team, which means I covered all the candidates, all their spouses. I think there were 15 candidates that year. I interviewed them all in their homes for an at-home series. It's how I first met Barbara Bush. But when the fall came for the general election and it was George Bush and Michael Dukakis, Barbara Bush and Katie Dukakis agreed to write a column for USA Today. It ran every Monday and I was their editor. And that's how I really got to know her well. And after the election, I was very surprised to be offered a job as one of her deputy press secretaries. I think we have a picture from the White House years that shows a much younger and thinner me. Um, that, that's at some event. I think that picture is actually from a 1992 event. But it, oh my gosh, it was so much fun being one of her deputy press secretaries. And I'm just going to tell you one story from her first lady years that illustrates everything you need to know about this incredible woman. Her very first full day as First Lady of the United States, she had her staff up to the residence for coffee, and she announced to us that she wanted to do something every single day to make a difference. Every single day, she says, I don't need a day off. She either wanted to do an event or maybe host a coffee or reception at the White House to help highlight a cause or a group or do media interviews. And of course, she counted in that making a difference, being there for her husband, being his, being the first lady to the President of the United States. So every single day, this amazing woman did at least one thing that she felt made a difference in the world. It didn't take long for us to realize just how strong her voice was going to be. Within the first couple of months of her being first lady, she did one of the most controversial things she would do in the next four years. She announced that she wanted to visit a place in Washington, D.C. called Grandma's House. This was a residence for children who had tested HIV positive. You have to understand that 30 years ago, there's the picture. This is the picture that was seen around the world. You have to understand that 30 years ago, AIDS and being HIV positive was, it was controversial. It was, people were scared to death. There were all sorts of misunderstandings and rumors about the disease and what it meant and how you could catch it. So the fact that she went to grandma's house and hugged not only a child, held a child and hugged a child that was HIV positive, but she also met with an adult group of men and women, mainly men, who were HIV positive, several of whom told her that their families no longer spoke to them. And one of the one of the men said to her, will you give me a hug? My mom will no longer hug me. And again, that was seen around the world. I want to just read to you a short paragraph of what that visit meant just to put it in perspective of how different things were then. This, this was written when she died in 2018, the two wonderful women who ran grandma's house, Debbie Tate and Joan McCarley, wrote an op-ed piece for the Washington Post in 2018, 
about this visit in 1989. And this is what they wrote. Looking back at that time, despite being the first lady and a woman of significant wealth, she was a risk taker and a change agent, unafraid to utilize her considerable influence to change attitudes. At the height of the HIV AIDS crisis, she single-handedly educated the world, saying that it is okay to support places like Grandma's House. Again, I wanted to share that just because it is, it is the perfect story to illustrate how Barbara Bush used her bully pulpit to make us a better country and a better world. Bully pulpit was a word used by Lady Bird Johnson when she was first lady. And Mrs. Bush embraced the concept that when you're first lady and when you're a former first lady, you have a bully pulpit and you need to use it. That's why it was such an honor to work for her. I wanna read just quickly, um, in 1991, still first lady, she gave a series of commencement speeches, and I wish I knew what was going on in the world. Um, I actually did some research and couldn't figure it out, but Mrs. Bush was obviously very disturbed by what she saw as an intolerant society, and that was her theme of all her commencement speeches that year. I just want to read a couple, couple excerpts from a couple different speeches. Says, I would like for you to think about your relationships in a broader sense, the way you feel and interact with people beyond your loved ones. I'm talking about the, the need for greater tolerance in our society. To be different, that is what life in America is about after all. It can be difficult to be different in our society. It is too easy to be intolerant. Tolerance is much more than just respecting people of a different race. It is a constant stream of little acts in our daily lives, big and small choices we make every single day about how we, how we think about, how we talk about, and how we deal with other human beings. We should be alarmed at the rise of intolerance in our land and by the growing tendency to use intimidation rather than mediation to settle disputes. Political, political extremists roam the land. Keep in mind, this is 1991, setting citizens against one another based on class and race. Such bullying is outrageous and not worthy of a great nation grounded in the values of tolerance and respect. Let's fight back against the boring politics of division and derision. We must build a society in which people can join in common causes without having to surrender their identities. We have a proud legacy of freedom and independent thought. We can be better. You can do better. You can help us be better. Again, I wanted to read that just to show how she wasn't afraid to use her voice and how much we miss her voice today. I mean, she could be talking about us today. If she were still here and if President Bush were still here, her husband, they would not be happy about some of what you see on the nightly news. We still need her voice. Because of that, because of the fact we still need her voice, I wrote a book after she died called Pearls of Wisdom. Um, you will notice that it says by Barbara Bush. I do want you to know, I did have the kids' permission, the five Bush kids' permission to put their mother's name on the book. Um, I wrote it after she died, or I really put it together. It was a collection of all of her wisdom over the years. She was famous for giving advice. And I just, as, as George W. Bush, the 43rd president, says in the, in the prologue of the book, those of us who knew her and got her, adv her advice uh, every single day, we're better people for it. And so this book, we, we wanted to give everybody else a chance to learn from her the way we did. Um, so I followed them to Houston in 1993 to help her with her memoirs. And in the process, after we finished her memoirs, I eventually became President Bush's chief of staff. And, and I was his chief of staff for 25 years. One of the things I want 
I really want to end with, I wish I had two hours, but I only have 10 to 15 minutes. I really want to talk about their incredible love story. Um, before I do that, could you put up the photo of the book, uh, The Man I Knew? I think I'm skipping around a little bit. Uh, this is the book I just read, I just wrote, sorry, about President Bush. It came out June 1st. And we're not going to get off track and talk about him. I'm going to show you one photo from the book. If you could show the, the George Clooney photo. I am shamelessly showing you this photo because I know you're all going to go out and buy the book because you're going to want to know the story behind this photo. I mean, is he, are those not the two cutest Georges you've ever seen? But we're not, we're not going to talk about George Clooney today. Unfortunately, take one last look, lady. We're going to take that photo away right now. Instead, what I really want to talk about, I was going to talk about Mrs. Bush and literacy, but I feel like that all of you know how devoted she was to literacy. Uh, to the day she died, she never quit caring about making this country a more literate, uh, a more literate society. I, I have a cute photo of the two of them both reading to a group of kids. Um, there they are. This is at College Station, Texas. This is in the post-presidency. Mrs. Bush's big cause was to teach all of us to read, write, and comprehend. She truly felt that if we were a more literate society, more of our problems could be solved. But I feel that her devotion to literacy is so well known. Instead, I'm going to end by talking about their incredible love story. I'm going to show you a picture um, from their 70th wedding anniversary. George and Barbara Bush were madly in love until the day they died. And until the day she died, I guess I should say. She died in April of 2018. She died with him holding her hand. And he died in November. The he 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 managed to carry on about six months without her. We knew that he would go soon after her. They were always meant to be together. I'm just going to tell you one sweet story that I, I told in The Man I Knew. It was near the end for her. He was in the hospital here in Houston at Methodist Hospital. She was actually at home, but we got word that she was on her way to the hospital by ambulance, that she had taken a turn for the worse. I was at the hospital with him and I told him that Mrs. Bush was on her way. And he said to me, well, as soon as she gets here and she settled in, I want to go, I want to go to her room and be with her. So ladies, he just looked awful. He'd been in the hospital for about five days. His hair was sticking straight up. He was wearing an oxygen mask. He was on oxygen. He had on a hospital gown. He looked like any of us would look if we'd been in the hospital for five days. So I'm trying to fix his hair. I'm trying to make him look more presentable. I totally failed. There was really nothing I can do, could do with him. She gets to her room. They get her settled in. They get President Bush into his wheelchair and take him into her room. And she was somewhere else. She was not in a coma, but her eyes were closed and, and she was somewhere else. And he just held her hand and talked to her about the weather and just sort of visited with her. She all of a sudden opened her eyes and she looked at him and she said, my God, George, but you were devastatingly good looking. And then her eyes closed and she just went back to wherever she had been. And the nurses and I, we were sort of in the doorway we didn't know whether to cry or to laugh. And because he looked awful, he was not good looking at that moment, but it was such a sweet moment. And he caught my eye and he just sort of shook his head and he looked at me and went as if to say, well, Gene, it is what it is. I remember when again, toward the end, they both were complaining to me a lot about how the other one snored too much and they weren't getting any sleep. I put this story in the book, so I'm not telling any big secrets. And I finally said to him one day, I said, you know what, sir, sleep is so important. I have a lot of friends that are already sleeping in separate bedrooms from their spouses because of story. I think it's time that you two think about sleeping in separate rooms. 
I think he thought it was the dumbest thing I ever said to him. He looked at me and he said, absolutely not. He says, I have to be able to reach out and touch her hand in the middle of the night and know that she's there. I mean, ladies, how romantic is that? Um, she had definitely, Barbara Bush was one of the great icons of our, of our lives. Would George Bush have been president without her? I don't know. She was such an important life partner. I'm not, we will never know the answer to that. But I'm just, again, was so privileged to call her my boss, my mentor, and sometimes my friend. Thank you for letting me come today and zoom into your meeting and share these stories with you. And if you buy Pearls of Wisdom or The Man I Knew, uh, I'll send you a book plate. If I can figure out, you can figure out how to send me an email. Maybe you can do it through our great friends of the Washington Times Foundation. Let them know you would like a book plate. I'll be happy to send one to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jean. Your presentation took us right back to those years with the Bushes in the White House and Barbara Bush, a straight shooter, funny, loved her family fiercely, was a tremendous mother and grandmother as well as wife and political figure. Um, those pearls, I, I don't know how, but I had forgotten about her trademark pearls. Um, what a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Moving right along. Alexa Fishward is our next presenter. She is the former executive director of the Eleanor Roosevelt Center at Val Kill. Currently the senior advisor for the Women's Federation for World Peace International. Alexa Fishward is a relative of Eleanor Roosevelt through the Colonial Livingston clan. She served as executive director of the Eleanor Roosevelt Center at Val Kill in Hyde Park, New York between 1989 and 1992. She oversaw the center's many programs related to promoting Eleanor Roosevelt's legacy. For the past 25 years, Mrs. Ward has served in executive leadership roles with the Women's Federation for World Peace, which is an NGO consulting with consulting status with the Economic and Social um, Council of the United Nations. Alexa is a graduate of Georgetown University. She is the daughter of the late U.S. Congressman Hamilton Fish. Her family's political ties run deep and trace back to U.S. Secretary of State Hamilton Fish, who also served as governor and U.S. Senator from New York. Alexa lives in Hyde Park, close to her roots, with her husband, Dr. Thomas Ward. They have four adult children, one daughter and three sons, and one granddaughter, Alexa Fish Ward. <clears throat> Thank you, Vicki. It's so nice to be here with you and with Cherie and uh, Jean, and what extraordinary uh, information they shared with us. It was so real, so... Uh, so personal and so real. So I'm pleased to have this opportunity to share some about Mrs. Roosevelt. So unlike the other two speakers, I did not have the opportunity, the honor to work directly with Mrs. Roosevelt, who was our longest serving first lady. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt entrusted Val Kill with uh, the record of her thoughts, her achievements and her intentions. These guided me in my role as executive director to preserve, inherit, and build on the example and legacy of Anna Eleanor Roosevelt. The Roosevelt Estate, which I hope that you all will take the time to visit if you haven't already, houses uh, the presidential library and the, the first presidential library ever created, the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute, and is in collaboration with the Eleanor Roosevelt Center at Valkyll. During my time as Val Kill's director, I had the privilege to have access to the historical record and to work with some of those who knew Mrs. Roosevelt, including some Roosevelt grandchildren, Curtis Roosevelt and Anna Eleanor Roosevelt Seagraves. These were the siblings who were raised in the White House and were affectionately known to all Americans as Sisty and Buzzy. So much of Mrs. Roosevelt's story is familiar to you, but please allow me to, to share some points. 
So 1905, Eleanor Roosevelt, as her name was, her maiden name, the niece of President Theodore Roosevelt, married her distant cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, and moved to the Roosevelt family estate in Hyde Park, New York. This estate stretched at that time from the Hudson River inland approximately two miles. So Mrs. Roosevelt loved to spend time with family and friends in the easternmost part of the property. In 1924, with FDR's encouragement and support, a cottage was built along the Fall Kill Stream, which Mrs. Roosevelt named Val Kill. In 1926, along with three of her friends, Mrs. Roosevelt established the Val Kill Industries, which was a skills training program and handcraft workshop that it provided employment for local families. Val Kill became Mrs. Roosevelt's primary residence from 1945 until her death in 1962. 13 years after she died in 1975, a group of Hyde Park residents and friends of Eleanor formed the Val Kill Cottage Commission to promote the preservation of the site in order to honor Mrs. Roosevelt. In 1977, the Eleanor Roosevelt National Historic Site was established by the US Congress to commemorate her life and accomplishments. This is the first and only National Historic Site dedicated to a First Lady. Also in 1977, the Val Kill Cottage Committee formed the Eleanor Roosevelt Center at Val Kill in partnership with and support of the National Park Service. From the 1920s, Val Kill served as a retreat where family, friends, and associates gathered to picnic and walk in the woods. It also served as a center for advocacy and activism. Mrs. Roosevelt described Val Kill as the place where, quote unquote, where I used to find myself and grow. On her own, as well as with her husband, world leaders were welcome to Val Kill. President, uh, sorry, Prime Minister Winston Churchill swam in the pool that uh, was built at Val Kill for FDR, and King George VI and Queen Elizabeth of Great Britain visited there for a traditional picnic that included hot dogs and coleslaw. It was there that leaders gathered and met, where students were inspired to dream of a brighter future for our country and the world. The Roosevelts were big thinkers. It was there they envisioned the United Nations also as an expanded, more perfected version of the United States. Upon the death of President Roosevelt, just a few weeks into his fourth term of office, Mrs. Roosevelt made the remark, the story is over. However, the story was far from over. A new history was about to begin from Val Kill and Eleanor Roosevelt would be at its center. In December, 1945, President Harry S. Truman appointed Mrs. Roosevelt as a delegate to the United Nations General Assembly, referring to her as first lady of the world. In April, 1946, she became the first chairperson of the preliminary United Nations Commission on Human Rights. She remained chairperson when the commission was established on a permanent basis in January 1947. She played the leading role in drafting the landmark Universal Declaration of Human Rights, known as UDHR, which recognizes the inherent dignity and equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. It was at her small desk in the living room at Val Kill Cottage, next to Stone Cottage, that Mrs. Roosevelt did much of her reflecting and writing challenging Americans to rethink their understanding of freedom, equality, and justice. She was a disciplined and prolific writer, and for a period of 27 years, she wrote My Day, a national syndicated newspaper column from December 31st, 1935 until September 26th, 1962, for six days a week and uh, until 1961, and for three days a week for that final year. For three years of my life, I had the privilege of working at Val Kill in Stone Cottage. I was led to reflect on the monumental tasks undertaken by Mrs. Roosevelt that touched the conscience of our nation. So at this time, I'd like to share a few slides with you just to give you a sense of this fabulous place we're talking about. So this is the Eleanor Roosevelt National Historic Site. And these, this is Stone Cottage. So this is the first cottage that was built um, at, the, uh, at this part of the Roosevelt property where Mrs. Roosevelt used to come out for retreats. 
And you can see in the second photo that it's right on a pond, which is called Valkill. So the word kill in Dutch means creek. So there are many, many, many areas in the Hudson Valley of New York that have the word kill. And Valkill is one of them. Next, please. Okay, so the slide you're looking at now is the one of President and Mrs. Roosevelt at Valkill. So though Valkill Stone Cottage and Valkill Cottage were known as Mrs. Roosevelt's retreat, uh, they spent much time there together and uh, uh, President Roosevelt swam there. It was, there was a pool built so that he could swim and he did a great deal of, of, his, of his swimming there. Next slide. So this one I love. Uh, this slide of um, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who visited Val Kill, and you can see he really enjoyed it, had a good time. You can see that Mrs. Roosevelt really enjoyed the opportunity to be able to chat with him there. Okay, so uh, really happy to share those few pictures with you to give you a sense of this very special place. So I'd like to move on and talk a bit about uh, Mrs. Roosevelt and her influence and leadership as it was really expressed through Valkyl. So I was hired by the ERV, we call it the L ERVK, Eleanor Roosevelt Center Valkyl. I was hired by the ER ERVK board of directors in 1989, which included the three women who led the effort to save Valkyl, Joyce Ski, Joan Spence, Margaret Zamorowski. At that time, the board was chaired by Vassar College's Professor Glenn Johnson and members of the original committee that saved Valkyl, as well as the, the early board of directors were both Democrat and Republican. So at the time I was working there, 1989, which was not long after it opened, um, the mission statement for ERVK was establishes forums for communication between individuals of differing viewpoints and provides seminars, research papers, and discussion groups. ERVK acts as a catalyst to create change for the betterment of humanity, all within the context of Eleanor Roosevelt's philosophy and example. So some of you may know uh, historians Blanche Wiesen Cook and Alita Black, and I'd like to just read a quote from them on Val Kill, which I really appreciate. Valkyl is a window into Eleanor Roosevelt's infinite courage and compassion, sturdy, comfortable, accessible, and enduring. Valkyl Cottage is the personal symbol of Eleanor Roosevelt's life, part home, part refuge, part retreat, part political laboratory. Valkyl was a space held closest to her heart. So 1987, uh, ERVK founded uh, the Eleanor Roosevelt Valkyl Medal program and ceremony. And the Valkyl Medal program honors individuals who have embraced Eleanor Roosevelt's call to build a better world through humanitarian efforts in education, advocacy, social justice, as well as civil and human rights. Medalists are role models for the larger community setting the standard for community values. So through the years, some of the medal, medal recipients have included former First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton, environmentalist Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Reverend Norman Vincent Peel, Dorothy Height, an African-American civil rights and women's rights advocate, the uh, Congressman Barbara Jordan, Queen Noor of Jordan, and actors James Earl Jones, Fred Rogers, and Richard Gere. There was also a very active Friends, of, Friends organization at ERVK of community members who, who served in so many ways in the community representing Mrs. Roosevelt. So I'd just like to mention briefly a couple of interesting programs that were initiated while I was there. One was called Enhancing Racial Harmony. So Enhancing Racial Harmony project was one of the uh, major projects I oversaw. It actually was an outcome of the racial divide and breakdown in the Hudson Valley region of New York that resulted from the Tawana Broly controversy. The project consisted of five focus groups in the areas of criminal justice, education, Sorry. employment, housing, and the media. Each group met on a monthly basis and made recommendations for addressing racism in their respective areas. So the issue of racial discrimination was something that was Mrs. Roosevelt took a stand on in her public life, guiding her to become a voice for equal rights and racial justice. 
Also, her personal awareness was grounded in a deep, deep sense of empathy. Mrs. Roosevelt played an important role in the creation of an executive order that prohibited discrimination in industries engaged in military production early in World War II. She supported the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II and joined the board of directors of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. I'd like to just mention one story briefly about her involvement in this area. Marian Anderson was one of the most talented American singers of the 20th century. She became an important figure in the struggle for black artists to overcome racial prejudice. So in 1939, the Daughters of the American Revolution uh, refused to allow Mrs. Anderson to sing in Constitution Hall in Washington, DC. Herself a member of the DAR at that time, Mrs. Roosevelt resigned following this decision. With the aid of President and Mrs. Roosevelt, Marian Anderson had the opportunity to perform to a crowd of 75,000 on Easter Sunday in 1939 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And this is uh, to this day still a very memorable moment. Uh, so my reflection is that this project engaged a wide range of leaders representing different political and religious views. It also included a number of individuals who had experienced racism in their lives. A very serious commitment was made to address the issues together. So during this time, we also had a program called Youth Against Racism. Mrs. Roosevelt was very, very concerned about young people. So during her husband's presidential administration, she was instrumental in the establishment of the National Youth Administration because she was, quote unquote, deeply troubled by the plight of young people during the Depression. The uh, National Youth Administration was established due to the president's trust in her and in her own and because of her own personal advocacy. Finally, during the years I was there, uh, we started educational seminars on the life and thought of Eleanor Roosevelt. And these seminars provided an opportunity to speak about Mrs. Roosevelt's influence and leadership, especially as it related to Val Kill. The seminars were held in collaboration with Elder Hostel and were held primarily at Val Kill with visits to local sites. Speakers included historians, scholars, family members, area residents who had personal experiences of Mrs. Roosevelt. I organized more than three dozen of these six day residential education seminars over a period of 10 years and continued to do it for seven years after I worked there full time. The participants came primarily from the US as well as from Europe. So I'd like to offer one personal anecdote. Um, on the day that I began to work at ERVK, uh, there was a Roosevelt family picnic right on the front lawn and um, outside of Stone Cottage, which was where our office was. So I went out and greeted the guests and I had the opportunity to meet Curtis Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt Seagraves. As I mentioned to you, those are the two grandchildren who grew up in the White House. So my grandfather, Hamilton Fish, had served in Congress at the time FDR was president and rep he represented the Hudson Valley of New York where the Roosevelts lived. They strongly disagreed on matters of policy. And this was quite no well known at that time. So when Curtis greeted me that day, when he came up and said hello, he expressed how pleased he was that I was working for ERVK and made the comment that history had made a full circle. So that was the start of our relationship and I had an opportunity to, uh, to get to know members of the family and do different activities with them. So in closing, I would just like to, uh, I would like to draw attention to a very unique exhibit at the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. And this exhibit is the content of Mrs. Roosevelt's wallet at the time of her death, at, on the day she died. So her wallet contained many things that are in your wallet and my wallet, cards, membership cards, um, licenses, things like this. But Mrs. Roosevelt's wallet included a number of prayers and poems handwritten by her on pieces of paper. And if you have a chance to see this exhibit, which I've looked at and visited many times, you will see that these pieces of paper had been in that wallet a long time. They were well worn. So I'd like to read you two of these in closing. The first is a prayer which is called the war prayer and in parentheses it said World War II. 
Dear Lord, lest I continue in my complacent ways, help me to remember that somewhere someone died for me today. And if there be war, help me to remember to ask, am I worth dying for? And then finally, this poem by Edwin Markham. He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexa. I want to go to New York. I want to visit these Roosevelt sites and um, I'm going to look up that prayer, that quote. This has been so heartwarming and inspiring, educational. It's been a thrill to be a part of this panel today. Thank you to our speakers, Cherie Harder, uh, Jean Becker, and Alexa Fishward. Thank you, especially to Cindy Pfeiffer for all of her work putting this program together. And to the Washington Times Foundation, Women in Leadership, I believe today you have encouraged high ideals and brought women leaders together, inspired us, and we remain devoted to the mission, devoted to America's founding ideals and to the nobility of public service. Thank you all. How beautiful to hear those words, Vicki. Thank you so much. And also for all the presenters um, taking their time to put their experiences together in such a short time frame, when in fact their knowledge is broad and comes from personal experiences that move us to understand the impact our First Ladies have and the very real sacrifices they make. Often as Sheree Harder showed that their convening power or the hospitality or soft power of a First Lady is often overlooked and that is what really moves people in, in a global diplomacy is the convening power, the soft power. And also from this, we can learn that there's many foundations we have in society. And these foundations, we can work with them and we can help each other and encourage each other. So Jean Becker let us know that Barbara Bush made it a point every day to make a difference, which also included supporting her husband. Making a difference meant to her being a risk taker and being an agent for change. Even in the end, she saw her husband from a higher perspective, saying, my God, George, you are devastatingly good looking. So I, we have many lessons to take with us that even when we are not noticed, or maybe we feel we're underappreciated, we can nevertheless create a tradition of service by raising up others and standing for public causes, such as we heard from Mrs. Alexa Ward. So some causes we are made aware of is the presentations of the First Ladies about challenging taboos or working with through the political spectrum, not, not focusing only on our own party that we believe in, promoting lit literacy as a way of problem solving and raising awareness to special issues, and especially for the power of global diplomacy, even being friendly with nations such as China, or excuse me, Cuba, we learned about having grace under pressure. So special thanks to all our panelists, Cherie Harder, Jean Becker, for their gracious pre-recordings, for Alexia Fish Ward and her wonderful presentation, and her many years of public service that it doesn't go unnoticed. And our wonderful moderator, Vicki Teahart, for her excellent work in moderating this program. And then also we have special thanks we'd like to make to our co-sponsors, the Women's Federation for World Peace and the Universal Peace Federation for their great support. So we would look forward to future programs. Thank you and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you so much.